And good afternoon or good morning here from Northern California. My name is Fran Capaletti and I work for the National Taxpayer Advocates Research Office. I still remember starting off in taxpayer service about 30 years ago though, answering phones and working on taxpayer accounts. And it was satisfying to help those in need and I'm happy to moderate this session. We have three presenters today. Rizwan Javed is an operations research analyst in the Taxpayer Behavior Lab of RAS with experience analyzing outreach efforts. Our second, Alex Turk, is a supervisory economist for the Policy and Program Impact Lab within the Knowledge Development and Application Division of RAS. Our third, Becca Scollin, is a principal human factors engineer and she comes from the MITRE Corporation. And we have our discussant, Mary Helen Rissler. She is a supervisory economist managing the compliance modeling lab with a staff of eight. Their work estimates the nature and extent of noncompliance. So welcome to all of you. And I would be ready now to introduce our first speaker. Thanks, Fran. Hi, everybody. Um, let me see if I can get the slides working real quick. There we go. All right, so I'll be talking about the uh, field experiment that we conducted in 2019 on paper filers and non-filers. I'd like to first thank my co-authors, Brenda Schaefer, Jacob Golden, and Tatiana Homanoff, and state that these are the views and opinions of the authors and do not express the official position of the IRS or the Treasury. Now, the experiment that I'll be talking about is actually a follow-up to the 2017 experiment that we did. Uh, in that experiment, we uh, sent materials to taxpayers who had previously filed a paper return with information about free assisted methods in an effort to get them to switch those uh, preparation methods. In 2019, we followed a uh, similar design, but we included not just paper prior paper filers, but also prior non-filers. So um, what I'd like to do today, I'll give you some background information on the project. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how the project came to be, what the purpose is, uh, briefly discuss the 2017 experiment and results, and then we'll dive into the 2019 experiment and wrap up with conclusions and plans for further work. So first, I want to give you a snapshot of tw tax year 2017 and what taxpayers were doing for their preparation type. Um, since 2017 will serve as the pool for our 2019 experiment sample. Um, we do see that most taxpayers use an assisted method of tax preparation, whether it was software or a third party preparer. Um, we do have a small group of 3.4% uh, of taxpayers who'd filed on, uh, on paper. So it seems like a small percentage, but that's actually 6 million taxpayers um, that uh, will focus this outreach on. Um, and for 2019, we also wanted to expand to non-filers, one of the things that prior research found was that if they received some type of a, a reminder notice, they were more likely to file. So we wanted our outreach to serve as not just a reminder for them to file, but also nudge them into using a free assisted method. Um, so 11.8%, that actually translates to about 20 million uh, non-filers and non-filers defined as somebody that the IRS has third-party income information for and they have not filed a return. So what are the free assisted methods that we're gonna be talking about today? The first is VIDA, the Voluntary Income Tax Assistance Program, and that's in-person assistance. Taxpayers whose income is less than or equal to 55,000 for tax year 2018 were eligible. That's 64% of prior paper filers that were eligible for this program. Uh, the free file program is the um, free online component and the income threshold is a little bit higher at 66,000 for tw tax year 2018 and 70% of prior paper filers were eligible. So less than 4% of apparently eligible taxpayers actually used VIDA and free file in their 2017 returns. And we've identified some potential bar barriers uh, for this. The lack of awareness could be one. Uh, there's just not enough marketing for VIDA or free file. There's a stigma of going to a VIDA site. There might not be a VIDA site near them. Um, oftentimes they do have limited hours or they may get too busy. Lack of internet connectivity. This is more so for free file than VIDA. No perceived benefit. If you have a simple return, you may not see any reason to learn about these methods. Privacy or security concerns, that can apply to both free file and VITA. And inertia, if you've been doing something that's always worked, why change it? So why does using an assisted preparation, uh, preparation method matter? 
Well, if you're not using assistance, you're on your own for selecting and obtaining forms. You have to be able to understand tax law. You have to be able to understand the deductions and credits that you're eligible for. Uh, for example, the earned income tax credit for taxpayers that use some type of assisted method, uh, they had a take up of about 92%, whereas those that paper prepared to return without any assistance only had an 85% take up. And then math errors are also a concern. Uh, taxpayers who um, used an unassisted method and filed on paper were 32 times more likely to commit a math error than those that use some type of assistance. Now from the tax administration side, cost is a concern. Um, it takes, it, it costs only about a quarter to process an electronic return, whereas a uh, paper return costs over $4. And those generally higher error rates can lead to longer processing times for refunds and even trigger a notice process. So um, let's talk about the 2017 experiment a little. The uh, design was to send a postcard with information about one or more of the following, uh, general VITA information, VITA addresses to the nearest sites of the taxpayer, information about free file, and information about my free taxes, which is another online uh, option, free online option. Um, and we had a total of five treatments that we sent out in January of 2017. And then we did actually do a later uh, mailing in March 2017 to three treatments. And we were trying to measure the 2016 return preparation method. And our sample was derived from 2015 paper filers whose income met the VITA eligibility ranges of 54,000 for 2016. We also restricted to taxpayers within 30 miles of two VITA sites. Um, and our final sample, we treated about 630,000 taxpayers from a population of a little over 2 million. Here's a look at the postcards that we sent out in 2017. Now this is for the treatment that has the free file information and then on the bottom you see the VITA information and we also have the boxes on the right and that includes the VITA addresses and the, their timings. So as you can see they're kind of small and getting the information in there was a bit of a challenge and uh, the vendor did actually have some issues with that. Um, so some of our treatments were impacted by that. So let's take a look at the results. Um, this is uh, for our base treatment. This is the treatment that included uh, the free file information and VITA general information, not the addresses since we had some issues there. And we see that the by being treated, the use of any assisted method goes up by about 3%. The use of software goes up by about 4% and VITA goes up by 20%. These are encouraging results and because of that, we did design a 2019 experiment with a similar design. One of the big lessons learned here was that because the postcard um, was not able to cap, uh, we were not able to put all the VITA information on there, we decided to switch to letters. So this would give us more room for all the VITA information. And another piece of feedback that we received was that those that are receiving uh, correspondence from the IRS would want it to be more uh, formal looking. And so a letter is more formal, whereas uh, a postcard might seem like a marketing material that they may disregard. So let's talk about the 2019 experiment. Um, the, the plan was to send letters with information about VITA and free file. We did have a total of five treatments that uh, we planned to send out in January 2019, but because of the government shutdown, we were pushed to March 2019. We were trying to measure the 2018 return preparation method, and our sample was derived from uh, 2017 paper filers and non-filers whose income were within the VITA eligibility range. And we restricted again to those taxpayers that were living within 30 miles of two VITA sites. And the initial sample was treatment groups of 25,000 taxpayers each split between paper filers and non-filers. So here's a look at the five treatments that we had and they include information of one or more of the following VITA addresses, uh, free file with a general link and free file with a wizard link and then control, a control group that received no letter. Now the difference between uh, the free file general link and the wizard link, the general link takes you to the uh, free file homepage and you have all the information about the program. And you also have um, a link for the, uh, the wizard tool on that site, which allows you to answer questions about your tax situation and generates a list of software that you may be eligible to use for free. So two of the treatments have that general link to take you to the homepage and two of the treatments have that wizard link that take you directly to the wizard tool. Here's a look at uh, letter 6168. This is for our treat treatment one, which has the information about VITA and the VITA addresses. And then you also have the uh, free file information there. This is the, uh, the, the general link. 
The only difference between the free file general and the free file wizard letters are the URLs are slightly different. So 2019 was not without its issues. Um, we did have the government shutdown between December 22nd and January 25th. And because of that, first our mailing was, had to be pushed from January to March, but also our database wasn't updated. And because of that, our window of measurement was reduced to returns posted between March 17th and May 25th. We did also have a sampling issue where our V-coded or software generated paper returns were not excluded from the paper file or sample. So we have this uh, table with our final sample. We started with uh, 25,000 per treatment, but we're sub down substantially less to about 10,000 uh, per treatment between paper filers and non-filers. So next up, we have the overall results for the 2019 experiment. Um, and here we have both paper filers and non-filers that were treated with any of the letters. And the big story here is that we see the numbers going in in the direction that we would uh, expect them to go. So filing rates are up for both prior paper filers and prior non-filers. VITA usage, we see an increase uh, for paper filers by about 72%. For non-filers, it's an increase of about 35%. And the free file usage is up for both groups as well. The paper filers are up about 24% and non-filers are up about 18%. So next, we're gonna break down uh, VITA usage. And we're gonna look at just the treatments that included the VITA information. And when we look at paper filers first, we see that each of the three treatments were equally effective with an increase of over 100% uh, when treated. Uh, treatment three there is at about 99%, but we see that all three treatments were very effective in increasing the usage of VITA. For the non-filer side, uh, it's, it's a little bit more mixed. We do see about a 43% increase in the usage of VITA when treated with any of the letters, but there's no significant difference for that, uh, the second treatment, which had the VITA information in the pre-file wizard. Um, and the largest increase came from treatment three, which had only the VITA information. And that increased uh, by about 78% when treated. So next, let's take a look at um, free file usage and how uh, that was impacted when treated. Uh, first, we'll take a look at paper filers. We see that uh, treatment one increased the usage of free file by about 50%. We don't see any significant difference in treatments two and five, which had the uh, free file wizard link. Um, but we do see for treatment four that had that general link and only free file information, no byte information, a 35% increase. For the non-filers, we see that um, we see an increase uh, when treated with treatment one by about 29%, and treatment five, which uh, had the free file wizard link, is the most effective, and increasing usage by about 38%, and no uh, statistical significance for treatments two and four. So here we're looking at the individual treatments. In the next slide, we're going to group treatments one and four, which have the general link, and two and five, which have the wizard link. Um, and we'll take a look at which link was more effective. So for paper filers first, we do see that the general link was more effective. It's about a 43% increase in the use of uh, free file when treated with, with, with the general link. For the, wizard, treat, for the wizard link, now we actually do see a significant increase of about 23%. Uh, the general link was still more effective, but now that we have that combined group, we're seeing some statistical significance. On the non-filer side, we see that being treated with either of the links seems to have a, a, an equal effect of about, of about a 22% increase in the use of free file. So the next thing we're gonna look at is age and how that impacts the usage of FIDA. So looking at paper filers first, we've broken down age into five quintiles. Uh, the first thing we'll notice is the fifth quintile, which is taxpayers aged 69 and older, have the largest uh, usage of, of, of VITA. Um, and we also see the largest percent, percentage point increase in VITA in that group. Um, what is surprising to us was the second quintile, those are taxpayers aged between 26 and 42. Even though the percentage point increase is lower, the percentage increase was higher at 134%. So perhaps there's an opportunity with these younger, taxpayer, younger paper filers uh, to change their behavior when treated. On, on the non-filer side, uh, we see a little bit more of a consistent increase when treated. 
uh, between 30 and 40 percent for all the quintiles except uh, the fourth quintile, which didn't have any significant increase. And the age groups for that was uh, 42, uh, age 40 to 52. So next we'll look at age and how um, that impacted the usage of free file. For paper filers, the only uh, significant increase we see is for the second quintile. Um, and those, again, are taxpayers aged 26 to 42. So maybe that's the group that is willing to uh, change their behavior regardless of whether um, it's gonna be for, to, to VITA or free file. Um, on the non-filer side, we see significant increases between the second and third, in the second and third quintiles. Uh, the age group for that is 21 to 39. So we have younger uh, taxpayers that are more willing to switch to free file. So to wrap up, we did see that our experiment was effective in increasing not just the uh, filing rates when, when treated, but also increasing the usage of VITA and free file when provided that information. Um, individually, we see that treatment one maybe seemed to be the most effective. It had significant increases for both paper filers and, and non-filers um, for both the use of VITA and free file and oftentimes had the uh, largest magnitude of increase. So as we uh, continue our research, we did have a 2020 experiment. So we'll take a look at some of the same elements we did for the previous two experiments. Um, we did have a larger sample size for, for that experiment and we were able to get it out in February of 2020, the earlier part of filing season. So those are positives. So we will have to consider the impact of the uh, coronavirus pandemic and uh, a few different factors that, are stem from, that stem from that, which include the early closure of VITA sites, the extended filing deadline, and then the stimulus bill, which may have impacted when taxpayers filed their return. Uh, so we'll continue to uh, analyze all three years of the experiments as, as one and make recommendations for future potential outreaches. Uh, I thank you all for listening. I look forward to your questions. And next up is Alex Turk, who will be discussing enforcement versus outreach, the impact on taxpayer burden. Thank you. Thanks, Rizwan, and uh, thanks to the organizers of the conference. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, so what I'll talk about today is a, a, a follow-on research to uh, previous research that we did, uh, Herlash et al., and this was presented at last year's conference, uh, looking at enforcement versus outreach and looking at the impacts on time to file, penalties, and call volume. So what we're looking at here are alternative ways to treat non-filers or, or, and treat high-risk non-filers. So, this study, a lot of what uh, the study is really looking at is new treatments and new timing of treatments. And uh, we've talked a little bit before about the automated underreporting and document matching. Well, non-filer processes are, are part of that document matching. And so it does take a while for us to, to do that and start the non-filer process. So this, this project's looking at what happens if we, if we get out there earlier and are able to contact taxpayers in a more timely or the more salient treatment uh, to impact their, uh, impact their compliance. So, um, and kind of a spoiler alert, a lot of the juice uh, from this squeeze does come from that earlier intervention, not necessarily from the different alternative treatments, but so we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go. Um, and I wanna thank my co-authors here. They deserve most of the credit um, um, and most of the hard work so hopefully I will be able to, to represent their hard work well. Okay. Okay, quick background uh, of, the, of the presentation. We'll talk about the background and the design. I will go over some of the previous research just to kind of set the stage. And we'll talk about uh, the different results and, and the impl implement implications um, from the, uh, of, of the results and how they can be used. So. Okay, so what we're really looking at is um, trying is is taking our follow-on research to, to a to an outreach study and and really looking to some degree at the intensive margin. How does these treatments in, impact the time to file, and hence the penalty implications and 
and contacting the IRS. So really trying to look at this also from the taxpayer's perspective, um, while time to file and contacting the IRS are not direct burden estimates, but you can think of them as related to burden, penalty implications, you know, a penalty avoidance is a financial, you know, penalties are a financial burden, the old allingham Sandmo model where penalties are an important piece of it. So, but, but it, for penalty avoidance, you know, that you can think of that as at least a lower bound for, for burden reduction. Um, if you think about this in some sort of revealed, revealed preference argument, you know, taxpayers in assuming or choosing to uh, pay a failure to file penalty rather than to file, um, the, you know, the net, their net utility in, in, in the non-compliant state must be higher. So if you can reduce the penalty that they get subject to by them changing their actions, you're also reducing burden. So, all right. So quick overview of the, of the pilot design. So uh, this is a randomized control trial. So in, uh, in filing year 2018, so when taxpayers would have been filing their 2017 tax return, uh, we identified a sample of um, high-risk non-filers. And these are basically identified non-filers who hadn't filed their tax year 16 return and had not yet been treated uh, for, for that tax module or for that tax return. Um, so this is a randomized control trial. We had three different waves of treatment. We, we first contacted the taxpayers in April 2018, right before they would have filed that 2017 return. Then again, around the extension deadline in October, and then again in mid-December, and that's when the, around the time when typical non-filer delinquent return notices would go out, okay? So, and we're looking at what, what sort of behaviors do we have, see around these taxpayers around filing that delinquent return for tax year 16, filing the current year return, and then also the subsequent or, or, or uh, subsequent compliance for tax year 18 or that in quasi indirect effect. Okay. So this was a, a, um, a fairly complex design. Uh, we had taxpayers treated in three waves in in the in some taxpayers were treated only in wave one, some only in wave two, some only in wave three, some in wave one and two, some in wave two and three, and then one group treated in wave one, two, and three. And that's going to be one of the groups we focus on because the previous research has sh sh showed the the impacts uh, are some of the larger impacts you know, for that treatment. So we're also so in wave one, taxpayers were sent a filing reminder uh, letter. Um, and, and another group was also sent, we started the, the two tax year 16 delinquent return notice. Um, then in wave two, uh, some taxpayers were received that soft contact letter, uh, a soft contact letter about their 2017 return uh, if they had not filed. And then in wave three, some taxpayers received that soft contact letter or that tax year 17 delinquent return. And, and a lot of the results to all these different treatments are in, that pre, in our previous paper. Um, but with this design, we can estimate those, you know, those treatment effects, the marginal treatment effects, uh, incremental, you know, a, a second contact given I've already been treated by the first contact and et cetera. And we can also compare, you know, sending the tax year 16 delinquent return notice versus waiting and just waiting till the 17 return, delinquent return return comes out. So. Okay, so quick summary of some of the results from the previous research, and this is on the impact of the, uh, more on the extensive margin, on the impact on filing, basically whether or not they filed their return, by, and we track results through May of 2019, okay? So what we're illustrating here uh, are the estimated treatment effects from, a, from, our, from our logistic regression model. Um, and this chart is showing you the impact on filing of that two, tax year 17 return. So the blue, the dark blue bars are the impact of the first wave of treatment. The, the light blue is the, the, the impact of the second wave. Uh, and the, the red is the impact of the, the treatment that they would have received in the third wave. So this chart's comparing starting the, the 16 delinquent return to the simple letter with a follow-up uh, soft letter and then the 17 return delinquent return notice to the overall, you know, just waiting and starting the 17 delinquent return. Okay. So basic results from this is that, you know, there are, one of the things is we found is there are trade-offs uh, messaging around 
past noncompliance and during this time when you are filing your next tax return tends to seem to seem to crowd out current year compliance. We did, you know, when you started sending tax year 16 delinquent return notices, we did get a lot of 16 delinquent returns, but we got less in terms of noncompliance. You think about the decision process that a taxpayer with delinquent return is going through when they're filing, they've got their delinquent return they're supposed to file, they've got their current year return they're supposed to file, uh, and then they've got, they've got their current, the next tax year return, which they're starting to make payments on, right? Because you gotta adjust withholding or make estimated tax payments, et cetera. Okay? So this shows you the impact uh, uh, on, of that first way uh, on that current year filing of, of return. So you can see that the soft letter or the reminder letter secures more returns than waiting and, and, secure, and, and starting the delinquent return notice. Um, and what I'll show you on the next slide is that timing matters. Uh, the earlier you resolve issues, the more likely you are gonna get voluntary compliance next year. So if we move on to the next slide, so here we're showing the impact of each of these same treatments uh, on filing of that 16 return on the left, and then the chart on the right is showing you of filing the next year's tax return. Okay, so you can see the delinquent return notice for 16 does get a lot of those 16 returns. Now, uh, one caveat of that is we didn't stop those cases from going down the compliance work stream. So they are in that compliance stream. It's not just from the notice. Um, but if you look at the 2018 return, this is where those early contacts um, really promote a lot more voluntary compliance and you get people filing the next year without treatment. Um, so this is, this is, this supports the notion that if I resolve my past issues earlier, I'm more likely to be able to get right and, and, and be not be voluntary compliant. So think of this, you know, in a, uh, in terms of the tax gap, if we were to go to a new steady state where we're doing more of this activity, you're going to start to grow or shrink that gross tax gap around non-filers because you're going to get more voluntary compliance. Okay. So, so what we want to focus on here is, 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 is the, uh, the impact of these treatments on the time to file or on an intensive, an intensive margin. Um, so what we did is we took our, we took our, our study data, uh, our randomized control study data, and, and used a proportional hazard model to estimate the expected time to file given some covariates um, and then our, our, our treatments in our study. Um, so we, like most, most proportional hazard models, we have this pro, you know, right censoring because we don't track taxpayers through the end of time until they ultimately we see, see them file. Um, so we track them through May 31st, we have that right censoring. But we also have left, uh, left truncation because taxpayers entered into the treatment protocol at different points in time because some taxpayers were not contacted until the third wave, let's say. And that's, okay. So we're gonna use this model to estimate these, uh, these treatment effects. Okay, so here's, here's the, uh, the, the uh, um, results from our proportional hazard model, the parameter estimates, standard errors, et cetera. And you can see that um, the, the there is a significant impact of the TY16 delinquent return notice and the simple letter. And then under that, there's um, the additional impact of the wave two treatment and then the wave three treatment uh, for, for the delinquent return notice. You can see those are not significant and they're a little bit smaller, uh, but the, the TY17 delinquent return notice is just, just kind of on the margin of significant. I should note that this, this run RCT was, there was about 65,000 taxpayers in our control trial, about 15,000 of them were in the control group. Um, okay. Uh, so we also, and so you see a fairly large coefficient on the TY17 delinquent return notice. Uh, part of the reason that's large is because this treatment is the one that is one of the ones that is truncated. This it's not because it doesn't happen until, um, you know, several months after we started the study. Um, so that's why that, that it looks look like a large effect, but it's because it's on the hazard rate is going, is, is going down or the proportion that are filed is going up, I'm sorry. So we also controlled for a couple of different um, uh, pre-existing or, or observable characteristics about the cases. Um, one, basically how 
a couple of model scores about that indicate how likely we are to get a return from this taxpayer, how responsive they were they were expected to be, and how likely are they to actually have a balance due on that account on that on that return versus have, owing, being owed a refund. Those are going to impact the the like the response. Um, and we're going to use those on, in, in the next in the, in the penalty analysis to kind of characterize the different type groups of taxpayers based upon the risk, you know, the observable risk. Okay, so um, if we look at we, if we look at the you know il to illustrate that impact of these treatments on the on the on the time to file. Um, so we, what we did is we categorized taxpayers into low, medium, and high risk. Basically, a low risk taxpayer was somebody who was likely to file and likely to not owe a, owe a balance due on that return. High risk were those who are not likely to file and likely to have a balance due on the, on the return. And then medium was basically in the middle. So this is just to categorize because you know the, the hazard, the treatment effect is going to be uh, basically you know in the in. The, um, is going to be different for different, you know, in the considerations of different types of taxpayers because we had a heterogeneous population. Okay, so the chart is basically showing um, the the treatment effects of the, the increases in the likelihood of in the time to file or the proportion that file across the various treatments. So, um, if we if we look at the 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 expected average time to file based on the hazard model um, of the of the the more proactive treatment, the filing reminder letter, soft notice, and then our then delinquent return notice, we see it's basically filing 89, 66, and 51 days earlier um, on average than, um, than, um, than the control group given, um, given those risk categories, okay? Uh, one thing to point out is you see the, the, the line for the art for the re delinquent return uh, notice for 17, is the second largest treatment impact, but that's basically that. So that's this is the counterfactual of what if that we were able to send that delinquent return notice right away when they didn't file the return, not several months after, as as the typical, as the standard, because it's it's backing out that that truncation part. Okay, so we see basically. Uh, a larger impact on the lower risk taxpayers. Um, so that's gonna have an impact on them in terms of penalty and, uh, and other things. Okay, so, so, one, way, so we, one way we looked at burden is to look at penalty avoidance. So the, the relevant penalties here are the ones we, and the ones we looked at were basically failure to file and failure to pay penalties. Uh, failure to file penalties basically is calculated on the amount of unpaid tax based on the return due date. Okay, so it's basically 5% uh, of the unpaid tax per month, uh, capping out at, um, at uh, 25%. Over. So, it, so the failure to pay penalty, I mean the failure to file penalty is only lasts for five months. So you can see that most taxpayers who don't file before we start the normal delinquent return notice, that penalty is gonna probably run their course unless they had filed a valid extension. Okay. Another important point is that um, the Taxpayer First Act actually increased the minimum penalty rates for um, for very for taxpayers. So the minimum penalty uh, under, under the Taxpayer First Act is now basically a hundred percent the lesser amount of hundred percent of the tax that should have been paid as of the due date of the return. That is the net the net the net balance due, or um, a fixed dollar amount. So if I had if I filed late one you know by one month and owed a hundred dollars in tax i would be also charged a hand hundred dollar failure to file penalty um, but if it was more than that that even if it was a few day a few month a month late it would it would be uh the minimum amount went up to 435 dollars uh as a result of the taxpayer first act and the sure act Okay, and then the other relevant penalty is the uh, failure to file penalty. Whoops, I need to go back one here, sorry. Um, failure, to, failure to pay penalty, uh, that's basically calculated based upon, um, 
Um, that's calculated based upon the amount of unpaid tax uh, based on from from when the, the, the not paid as of the due date. Um, and that's different depending on the status you were in in the collection process, whether um, um, whether you're in an installment agreement or whether we put you in, give you notice of intent to levy. Okay, so uh, so real quick, um, what we did is we basically used our, our model to to uh, calculate in a, the actual expected penalty rate for each taxpayer. So basically, for those taxpayers who filed and got a penalty assessed, uh, we computed a, a basically a, a rate, a daily rate based on the penalty amount divided by the number of days and the uh, the total balance subject to the penalty. Um, and then we use that rate to estimate the penalty savings in the counterfactual case where they would have received one of the treatments. Okay. Uh, and we can do this on basically different at different percentiles for uh, balance due 10, 25, because uh, you know, obviously the penalty savings from earlier action is going to be different depending on how much, how much tax you owe. Okay. So um, example of, of, of that result is basically uh, if we look at the impact on on the penalties for failure to file and failure to pay, for example, for that 25 percentile of the Baldu, so the the, the, the bottom quarter of, of Baldu with the balance due, it, for low risk taxpayers, about $95 in penalty savings by getting our most proactive treatment that using our early outreach with the additional uh, soft notice and then and then delinquent return notice. So by getting into acts act earlier, um, they're, get, we're, they're avoiding, avoiding penalties. So you can see the penalty goes up um, as the balance still goes up, obviously, but it goes down as the, uh, the, uh, the risk category is down because you know, the, the, the treatment effect is gonna be smaller on those, uh, those higher risk taxpayers. Okay, so, and if we look at, we also then calculate that penalty impact on both uh, after we simulated the impact of the taxpayer first act and those increased minimum penalties, you can see across the board, the penalty goes up and it does go up quite a bit for some of the lower risk, lower balance due to taxpayers. So um, the, the penalty calculation becomes now a lot more complex because you've got to consider this higher in, because the, the minimum penalty comes into play a lot more, more often because it, because it's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to increase the penalty, especially for people who are, are only a, a little bit late. Okay. The other thing we looked at is, is uh, what sort of impact do these have on call volumes? Uh, basically, you know, uh, sending out letters and delivering for notices are low cost, but when taxpayers call in, that's, that's a resource cost for the IRS, but it's also a cost for the taxpayers. It's, um, so if there's things that, treatments that we can do that reduce call-ins, but also get taxpayers to make, do the things that they need to do to, to you know, complete their obligations. That's, you know, that's a win for both sides, you know, for both the service and for taxpayers. And, and you can argue that that's going to also, that's going to reduce burden. Um, so by being, so we want to do is, is to look at, are, are we, by, by being more proactive, do we reduce call volumes or, and do we, um, while also getting more taxpayers to file. Okay, so just looking at our different treatments, and this is several of the different treatments um, in the study. Uh, these are the actual, just the raw call rates based on, um, in, in each wave of the, tr of the study, um, not controlling for anything else at this point, but you can see in the control group, you get a, uh, a, a fairly high call rate, and there's not a lot of difference between those and those the control group and those who get these filing, filing sent the soft contacts. So um, basically most, many of these soft, these soft notices are not calling, are not generating a lot of calls and a lot of taxpayers are calling um, even if we don't treat them because, and what we'll show just next is that, you know, there's other factors that are driving in calls and treating or not treating these non-filers or sending them a notice is not going to, to make them call in because they have, a, they have other, it's the compliance issues that make them call in, not necessarily the notice. Okay, so to explore that further, we looked at a logistic regression of whether or not a taxpayer calls, 
uh, to, to just estimate, estimate treatment effects and estimate the effects of other uh, actions, what we controlled for, other things like uh, whether they already have a balance due on another tax return or another delinquent return, um, whether they called in the previous year, how much income they have on information returns, type of income, those sort of things. Um, what we found is, is you know, the other compliance issues and the prior year calls and, and, and the higher income drove most of the calls and very little significant impact of uh, any of the soft contacts. Okay, so here's a, an estimate, the estimated treatment effects for marginal effects on call volume from that logistic regression. Again, this is reported as, as a function of, what well, say we contacted 100,000 taxpayers just to make the marginal effect easier to, to digest. But you can see the delinquent return notices tend to increase call, the call, calls, uh, but very small impacts from uh, from the soft, the first, the first wave treatments of you know the soft, soft letter and reminder letter. Okay. All right. So um, to wrap it up here, so basically the, the the main thesis here is that earlier treatment reduces burden by helping taxpayers avoid file early, avoid penalties, and and be able to avoid penalties in the subsequent years because now they're coming back into compliance or staying in compliance. Uh, and these can be done uh, by if by so it's not only reducing, uh, you know, cost to the IRS, but it's also re increasing taxpayer welfare by helping them avoid penalties and have other uh, compliance issues. Okay, with that, I will turn it over to Rebecca, Rebecca to talk about um, authentication on online services. Hi, thanks, Alex. All right. So um, I'd like to thank my colleagues at MITRE, uh, Rana Tenbrink, Melanie Shear, and Beth Abramowitz, as well as Alcora Walden of IRS Online Services. So to start, I want to briefly describe two important motivations behind our research. The two usability studies I'll review today focus on registering for secured IRS online services, which we consider the critical first touch point of the user experience. The IRS has been working for years to deliver new user-centered online services, but recently there's been new legislation that makes customer experience an imperative, uh, both across the government and at the IRS. So for example, the 21st Century IDEA Act, which stands for the Integrated Digital Experience Act, uh, was passed in 2018 uh, and aims to improve government digital services uh, by requiring that agencies modernize their websites. Uh, it emphasizes both providing secure and user-centered online services. And last year, the Taxpayer First Act passed. This act requires the IRS to develop a comprehensive customer service strategy. It also emphasizes providing secure services to taxpayers and requires that they meet best practices for online services in the private sector. The other primary motivation uh, behind our research is the digital identity guidelines developed by NIST, which was updated with new guidance in 2017. Once a federal agency has assessed the risk of a system or data and determines its level of assurance, they use NIST 863 for guidance on technical requirements around areas like identity proofing, registration, and authenticators. So the IRS uses their secure access system to register taxpayers and tax professionals. Uh, in order to access the services, it requires that, that personal information be provided during registration to verify those requesting access are who they say they are. So the image here uh, is a visualization of the identity proofing journey uh, within the digital identity guidelines. Uh, so at the start, an organization collects evidence from an applicant 
then validates that evidence, uh, and once it's been verified, uh, issues a credential to the applicant. Uh, within the guidelines, there are three assurance levels, and we chose to focus on identity assurance level two, uh, which I'll refer to as IAL2. Um, IAL2 introduces the need for uh, identity proofing that's either remote or in person, uh, and it requires a minimum of strong evidence from applicants. Uh, an example of strong evidence is uh, a real ID or a passport, um, or it can be a combination of several documents. So the digital identity guidelines also provide guidance for agencies on working with third-party credential service providers or CSPs. Uh, a CSP is a trusted entity that performs enrollment and identity proofing. And if the IRS were to ever choose to outsource its registration process, a CSP would identity proof users and issue a credential to them after the successful verification. Okay, so the IRS has the challenge of offering its users a way to register that both offers an excellent user experience as well as meets the updated NIST digital identity guidelines. Um, and the IRS began working to transform how they secure their services once the update was released. Uh, but it contains methods that may be new to many citizens, uh, such as strong remote identity proofing uh, and using a third party to register for an online service. So we conducted two qualitative user research studies to capture user feedback on uh, potential new methods for the IRS to identity proof citizens. Um, our, our first study, which we conducted in 2018, explored remote identity proofing methods with tax professionals. Uh, and our second in 2019 and 2020 um, targeted individual taxpayers and looked at similar identity proofing methods uh, as well as introduced fictional CSPs providing proofing for the IRS. For our first study, um, the Secure Access Usability Study, as we called it, um, we wanted to explore whether tax professionals are willing to remotely identity proof with the IRS, as well as identify any major usability or accessibility issues to address in the design. Um, to start, we created a wireframe prototype uh, with a flow modeled after a notional customer journey, uh, and it demonstrated methods approved uh, at NIST IAL2. In this case, uh, the wireframes were what we call low fidelity, meaning they're intentionally made to look like sketches on paper. Uh, we did this to emphasize the design was both early and very notional. Um, participants were able to click, you know, back and forth through the prototype pages, uh, but nothing was actually interactive. There were no uh, form inputs enabled within it. The wireframes uh, started on irs.gov and then stepped through uh, the, uh, the current at the time e-authentication screens, um, which was back in 2018. Um, so after setting up a password on irs.gov, participants, uh, and this was where the change was, participants were then prompted to open or download uh, the irs to go mobile app, where it asked them to log in with their new password and then complete identity proofing. And the proofing consisted of uploading a state photo ID uh, and then validating the ID using a process called selfie verification with liveness testing. So, um, that process, so once you've uploaded a picture of your document, um, in this case, the license, it will ask you to either take a selfie or hold the phone up in front of your face uh, and position it within, let's say, a circle or a square on your phone. Um, it then asks the user to perform an action uh, that verifies that they are truly in front of the phone. Um, so for example, following a dot uh, with your eyes across the screen. We did include a few minor errors in the process, uh, just to make it seem a little bit more realistic. Um, and afterwards, uh, 
they were asked for bank account and utility bill information, but we didn't show that in depth due to time. So we recruited 13 tax professionals. Uh, we used a listserv of secure access users. Um, the majority of our participants were over the age of 55 uh, and they were highly experienced. Um, 11 of them had six or more years uh, working in tax services. Uh, the sessions were held in January of 2019 and they were remote over a conference call with screen sharing. We used a semi-structured interview uh, both before and after they viewed the wireframes and we conducted a usability walkthrough with the wireframes. Um, so once we gave participants uh, access, um, we gave them the task of re-registering for secure access and asked them to think aloud as they used the prototype to complete the task. Um, our goal was to complete up to 15 interviews, but after 13, we chose to end the sessions um, and all interviews afterwards were transcribed and then coded for common themes and patterns. All right, so we did encounter some negative reactions to the wireframes, uh, but all of the participants, except for one, were willing to use remote identity proofing with the IRS with a license, for example. So this particular group reported fairly secure behavior with their smartphones, um, like, for example, keeping their operating systems up to date. Um, and all but one participant reported never sharing their passwords uh, with family or friends. But they also had a pretty low trust in technology. Um, like for example, one participant brought up that there was simply no way to persuade them that any technology would ever be secure. Seven of the participants had the mistaken assumption that the process captured their face and voice biometrics. Um, and someone believed the process captured and stored their image in that selfie verification um, process. And there were mixed opinions on the security and quality of facial recognition and financial data. Uh, for example, uh, for facial recognition, five participants made negative comments and eight positive. So for usability issues, uh, we looked at comments made without prompting during the prototype walkthrough, uh, as well as asked participants directly about it in the follow-up interview. Uh, some participants brought up the accessibility of liveness testing in smartphones. Uh, for example, two participants expressed concerns about the accessibility of liveness testing uh, because of a disability that would make it difficult to complete the process. Concerns were also expressed about the large number of older tax professionals who might be less familiar with technology. Six mentioned concerns that older generations won't be willing to adopt remote identity verification, either because it's so unfamiliar or they don't own a smartphone. Um, there were mentions of other potential usability issues like uh, knowing how to correctly format their address uh, when typing it in. Uh, the physical quality of a license, um, and access to a utility bill. All right. So when asked how the IRS might better design any initial notification or instructions on identity proofing, many of our participants wanted a lot more information about the process, like the what, the why, and the how. Um, despite wanting this information, most of the participants did not spend time reading the instructions provided. Uh, and we do believe this is an important design question to explore. All right, so we had three groups of recommendations based on our findings. Um, this first to improve communications around identity proofing. We recommend testing brief messages uh, that users must dismiss throughout the process. Uh, this way users see more of the important information uh, they need while they're engaged in the task. Uh, second, when communicating to users um, about remote identity proofing, we suggest that it's made clear to users uh, what data, data is captured uh, and what happens to it using plain language. Uh, and third, we recommended including multiple options for users to upload documents and validate them uh, to address some of those accessibility concerns. 
So the group of tax professionals that we spoke to uh, were willing to use the new proofing methods and the prototype. However, we did see some attitudes like, oh, I'll just do whatever the IRS asks me to. Uh, and, like we have no choice anyways. Uh, so we were curious how individual taxpayers might react. Uh, since they do have some choice, they can choose to call the IRS or they can just opt out of the, of the process. Um, we also wanted to add in the concept of a third party CSP uh, to see if perceptions might change uh, if another entity is performing the proofing. So for our second study, we created a prototype to offer participants a selection between two fictional CSPs, uh, one we called identity.com, uh, a government option, and a government option we called signup.gov. Uh, we did this to reflect the current landscape of CSPs and see if taxpayers have a preference. And once the selection was made, the prototype included similar concepts to the prior study. Uh, however, we did choose to leave out liveness testing uh, and focus on a wider range of um, identity proofing documents in the prototype. Uh, and just a quick note, participants saw the same prototype uh, with the only difference being the logo swapped out based on what they chose. The method of the study was similar to the secure access usability study. Uh, it was also conducted remotely with screen share. Uh, we developed a research protocol, which again, consisted of the semi-structured interview and a prototype walkthrough where we asked participants to think aloud while they interacted with it. We also added a short survey we developed on comprehension uh, and perceptions of trust and ease of use of CSPs that we asked before and after viewing the prototype. Uh, at the beginning of the session, uh, the survey defined a CSP by asking them to imagine using their credentials uh, for an online bank to register for a financial service uh, like insurance or a mortgage. Um, after we asked the same question, slightly altered to reflect uh, their selected CSP for an IRS account. Uh, and for this one, we recruited 19 individual taxpayers. Uh, we chose to focus on um, what we considered potential users of an IRS account. Um, so we asked participants whether they had owed uh, a balance within the past three years, and we only recruited those who said yes. Um, so those uh, interviews were conducted in uh, January of 2020. Um, we aim to recruit a balanced sample. Uh, you can see uh, we got you know, a few more men than women. Um, we also saw a range of incomes uh, with uh, about half earning 35 to 75,000. Okay, so like the secure access study, we found the majority of participants were willing to use the new forms of remote identity proofing for an IRS account. Um, ultimately, only two out of 19 expressed unwillingness to use uh, a CSP. Um, two thirds of them chose the .gov option. Uh, those participants considered it more secure um, and all but one stated a strong uh, preference uh, for a .gov when asked. On the other hand, five of the seven participants who selected the .com indicated that they did not hold a strong preference uh, for either a .com or a .gov option. And so this chart on the right uh, shows that the participants who had a lower trust in a CSP's concern about their data security uh, were more likely to select a .gov. Uh, and those who chose the .com were more likely to agree with the statement versus somewhat agree. Um, both groups chose somewhat agree uh, that a CSP can actually keep their information secure. Uh, half of the participants were also confused by having to select between two CSPs uh, and nine participants expressed a preference to work directly with the IRS. So we found that comprehension of what a CSP does is low, uh, but it does improve after use. Uh, this is based on an analysis of comments describing what a CSP does asked before and after the prototype walkthrough. Um, and uh, in our comment analysis, we also saw concerns we believe should be addressed to increase the adoption of using a third party, uh, like more transparency on how personal information is handled.
Um, as for usability, we found that most participants expected a very quick experience, no more than five minutes. We saw their perception of usefulness increase, um, while their perception of ease of use decrease in our CSP survey um, after using the prototype. Uh, and we think that this is likely due uh, to the walkthrough being slower than expected. Um, so let's see, and we've got um, some charts of both uh, of the documents that people selected here. So we grouped our recommendations uh, after the study into four categories. Uh, first, we conclude that individuals are willing to work with a third party, uh, despite a stated preference from half of our participants to create an account directly with the IRS. Um, second, we found that offering a choice between more than one CSP had a negative impact on the user experience. Uh, half of the group had a negative reaction. Um, um, and some participants uh, made very quick decisions just based on a logo or a header. Seem to have lost the slides. Okay, it's coming back. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so third, despite the uh, general acceptance uh, we found of selfie verification. Uh, we found enough questions and concerns in our analysis of comments uh, to recommend that the IRS play, pay close attention uh, to the usability of this part of the process. Um, and finally, we noted some recommendations on design. Um, like, so one example is just the, the term selfie, uh, we think maybe leading to users thinking that the, the image is being stored in a database somewhere, um, just because selfies tend to be, you know, taken and stored and shared. Um, all right. There we go. I'll try to go through this very quickly. Um, so in looking at our findings uh, from both studies, we saw that both groups were willing to use these new forms of remote identity proofing with the IRS, um, despite some reservations, mostly around the license validation. Um, we assume that tax professionals will also prefer, prefer a government-run CSP. Um, our tax professionals were more security-minded and less trusting of technology. Um, and our individual participants who were less trusting of CSPs tended to select the .gov option. Uh, but both groups may also be willing to engage with a commercially, commercially run CSP uh, if they're assured of security and get a really great user experience. And as we reviewed the landscape of vendors offering uh, these new proofing services, we noticed uh, a lot of jargon and technical terms and we feel that people are not familiar with and we recommend avoiding that. Um, also, any system design will have to strike a balance between informing and assuring users uh, who are likely to only quickly scan or even skip over content, as we noticed in both studies. All right, so ultimately we see our research in support of the IRS in offering a digital identity solution that's both secure and usable for all citizens. Um, and we continue to advocate for more in-depth user research uh, on these concepts uh, to improve the safety and access uh, to all government services. So thank you all. I'm going to hand it over to our discussant, uh, Mary Helen. Okay, I think I have control now. Um, thank you, Becca. Um, I wanna thank the organizers of the conference and Alan for asking me to be a discussant. Um, most of my work is in the area of reporting compliance. So it's been an interesting change of pace to read these papers and presentations since they're all about taxpayer service focused. Um, I learned quite a bit by doing that. So earlier today, Janet Holtzblatt mentioned that she um, wasn't very um, in favor of um, the 
economic kind of experimental design. So I'm going to preface my comments by stating the fact that I have a very narrow view of the types of services that I would put in the bucket of taxpayer service. I tend to be very wary when I hear the phrase customer service or taxpayer service. Um, I'm generally expecting that the next step is going to be someone trying to convince me that cost shifting to me is somehow in my benefit. So when I think of taxpayer service, I'm thinking and looking at something that's really providing new or added value to the taxpayers. And so some things that uh, are touted as customer service, I would put in a separate bucket of um, efficiency and cost shifting, where the purpose is to minimize customer taxpayer time and money cost in the process of shifting costs to the taxpayers. So fortunately for each of these papers, I actually did find a taxpayer service angle to them. So the first paper is the free assisted tax preparation outreach experiments. And in this paper, they're looking at the effect of providing taxpayers with information about tax preparation and filing services and methods that they might not be aware of and perhaps might find some value in. And that does seem to be, you know, a, a taxpayer service value. Um, in the second paper, enforcement versus outreach, um, that takes what I would characterize as sort of a non-traditional view of taxpayer service um, by looking at taxpayer service within an enforcement setting. Um, that analysis is exploring whether different types of treatment stream options affect the timing of delinquent return filing, and then looks at the benefit of the taxpayers of a process that motivates them to file sooner than they otherwise would have. And the benefit there is it would reduce their late filing penalties and interest. And that too does seem to provide a real benefit to taxpayers. And finally, the third paper, Perspectives on New Forms of Remote Identity Proofing and Authentication for IRS Online Services. Um, that is looking at, they looked at and conducted one-on-one -on -one interviews with some taxpayers to gain insights into the receptivity, opinions, confusion of potential identity proofing in order to use those insights in the potential development of these features of a remote access. And that also definitely seems to have a very taxpayer service focused um, because you're trying to get taxpayer input in the design of um, a, a, a process and um, an application that you're building. So as I read through the papers and the presentations, I jotted down um, some general questions and thoughts and things that I would like to see um, perhaps in in, in revisions to the papers or if there are other studies planned. And what I wanted to do was just run through, um, run through each, of each, each paper with those. So the first paper is the free assisted tax preparation outreach experiments. And the conclusion I got here was sending an outreach letter near the beginning of the filing season to certain taxpayers who look like they're eligible for VITA or free file does increase the numbers of taxpayers who use those options. So the, the, the questions and, and areas that I'd be interested in learning more about are, uh, I'll run through first here. Um, I looked at the math error statistics reported in the paper, and it seems to me that maybe they need to be revisited. I was a little surprised at them, and I wondered if they were actually comparable since the processes differ. Um, I know that when you file electronically, if you make certain mistakes, your return is rejected. And certain people, especially when there's the use of a duplicate TIN that somebody has already used your taxpayer identification number, that you can't file electronically, that you're relegated to filing on paper, and you're automatically going to be math errored. So I was a little confused about those statistics and wondered if they were really comparable, especially since that was one of the mo motivations behind the experiment. So the second point is that the, the research finds statistically significant effects, but those seem to be relatively small changes, and I was wondering what the practical relevance of that was in implementing an actual permanent program there. Um, so I'd be interested in seeing more that translated those analytical estimates into sort of practical 
um, dollars or other effects so that IRS decision makers could decide, could have a better information for deciding whether or not they wanted to implement this, this as, a, as a permanent kind of program. Similarly, I'd be interested in knowing whether perhaps you might be following these taxpayers over time to see if they had a permanent change in their filing mode or whether this was a one-time thing. In terms of, I think, sort of the taxpayer service angle, it would seem to me that we would have a better sense of whether taxpayers actually valued the new methods if they changed those, if that was sort of a permanent change. Um, you know, you can always do something once and you decide you don't really like it and you go back to what you're doing. So it seems to me that looking at the taxpayers over time, especially those who, who switched modes, would give us a better indication that that notification put them on a path to get a method of filing that they preferred. Um, as I mentioned, I'm big into reporting accuracy. And so my question is, um, it's fine to get people to file certain ways, but are there any plans to looking, looking at reporting accuracy? And then also, um, I was wondering what are any forthcoming recommendations for a permanent program since it looks as if this um, pilot has been in effect for two or three years now. Moving on to the next paper, enforcement versus outreach. Um, in this also, the study conclusions are that earlier notification appears to speed up time to file the delinquent returns and thereby reducing penalty and interest owed by the taxpayers. And that does seem to have um, a benefit to taxpayers. So again here, I was interested in knowing whether there's a plan to follow these taxpayers over a longer period of time to see whether or not they maintain their filing behavior or um, they go back to non-filing. Um, part of this perhaps is an interest in maybe there are certain taxpayers where maybe every year you need to send them a reminder. Um, I'm gonna skip over the next, the, the next point um, and go on to the, the third point here about telephone calls. So all three papers mention phone calls and mentioned that phone calls are expensive. My, my question here is, um, are taxpayers who call more likely to file or file sooner so that for certain taxpayers, calls are an important component on their path to being compliant. I know in IRS, there's all this talk, we wanna reduce phone calls, we wanted to reduce phone calls, but um, I, I question whether sometimes a, a phone call is an important component. Um, and so again here, um, similar to the previous paper, it's good to get people who should be filing returns to file the returns. Um, it also is good if those returns are accurate. So my question is, or um, point is that, um, are there any plans to look at reporting accuracy? And, and if this study is continued into the future, that might be something to add to the, the plan. And um, the final comment here, similar to the earlier study is, what are the plans for implementing this, any of these tested processes as the standard IRS process for non-filers? So finally, moving on to the last paper, which is the perspectives uh, on new forms of remote identity proofing and authentication. So the, the takeaway here was that um, the usability interviews with these likely users of IRS online service that, that require this type of ident identity proofing suggests that in general, there was an acceptance of these requirements and processes and it provided a lot of insights that could be incorporated into the development to avoid confusion and misunderstanding and create a better taxpayer experience. So um, I was interested actually in um, understanding a little bit more about why these two groups were selected. Um, were they expected to have um, sort of the average perceptions and reactions? Um, were they the first um, two groups of types of participants and there's plans to interview others to see if they have any different opinions. Um, so that was one thing that I was um, interested in. So um, I sort of got stuck on this .gov versus .com third party credential service providers. Um, and I, I actually probably wasn't totally clear on what the .gov one was. And so 
I, I wasn't certain whether the one with .gov was not the IRS, but a different government agency, or whether the .gov was a commercial provider um, under contract to the government. Anyway, the, 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 the point here is that I, I think for transparency purposes, that that needs to be very clear. And I, I spent a whole lot of time looking up who can use a .gov. And if you believe Wikipedia, you know, GSA is the one who uh, al allows people to have a .gov extension for the internet. Um, the other thing too is I, I spent a little bit of time looking on irs.gov and it seems to me in situations where there's third parties commercial, it's very, very clear um, for the um, contract collection contracting out, it's very clear that they've, their collections have been assigned to a, f a commercial third party. If you're paying your taxes by credit and debit card, it is very clear that they're private companies and it gives you all the things. I tried to look up PTINs and um, I, I didn't get too far there, but it, it seems to me that um, this is a very important transparency thing that um, it should be very clear to taxpayers whether or not they are actually dealing with the IRS or not. Um, and so the, um, the final comment is that um, it wasn't totally clear to me how long it would take people to do this identity proofing and authentication to have access to online services, but it seemed to me that there it would take enough time and it would involve sharing enough personal information that it seemed to me that the purpose for which the taxpayer would want to do this would have to be sufficiently frequent or of sufficient importance to have them go through that. So I guess my question was, is in the background here in IRS decision making, are there sort of um, discussions that would connect this type of identity proofing for certain types of online services? And so with that, I would like to thank all the authors and the presenters for very interesting papers, and I'll turn everything over to Fran for the Q&A session. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh and again, we welcome from the audience in the box to, for the Q&A um, to, to that. I was curious while we're waiting for that, I, Mary Helen had some good questions in her remarks. Are there any you panelists would like to address briefly now? Um, this is Becca Scullin. Just briefly, so just to clear up the, the .gov issue, Mary Helen, that you asked, we are talking about a a government-run CSP that would be a separate agency from the IRS, um, which was, you know, also confusing to our participants. Um, but this would be uh, not the IRS, but within the government, the federal government. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Mary Helen, thanks for your comments. Um, I'll try to respond so so on in terms of the the impact of the calls on filing etc i think that's a great point and that's something we had talked about looking at to say to what degree can we model this in a more multivariate sense and say okay how do does the cause call actually help them uh file earlier or or file at all um, but i think a lot of the data shows that it's it's other reasons why they're calling uh this this the the treatments are are only a small part of some of the compliance problems they have. Um, and I think uh, around the implementation, there's, uh, we're working on a proposal to, uh, to incorporate this into a broader uh, strategy for uh, reaching out to taxpayers and especially being able to reach out to a broader set of the potential non-filers, whereas, uh, you know, those that, you know, especially the ones that, you know, are owed a refund. Thanks. Yeah, I do have a question coming in. Ruth, um, did you have any other? I, I, I was curious about the practical versus statistical significance too. Sure. Um, yeah, I did have uh, a few notes from Mary Ellen. Thank you so much uh, for all the uh, comments. Um, I first wanted to start with uh, the small changes and 
kind of quantifying that to dollars. I think that's still something that we, we are thinking about because in, we did see that only 4% of the taxpayers that were eligible for these programs had actually used them. So 4% is 4 million of 100 million. So there is a huge scale and a large number of people that we can reach. And so the numbers may seem small because of our sample, but there, there's a huge opportunity there that we can continue to build on. Um, and the, you also mentioned the one-time change versus permanent. That is something that we are tracking for uh, the 2017 experiment, those that were in the 2017 experiment, and we will for the 2019 one as well. Uh, recommendations for a permanent change. I think that things continue to change even with this year's filing season because of the pandemic and because we're having to rely on more online resources. Uh, we'll have to see how that dynamic changes and we actually have a online component for VITA that we are interested in using next year. So. Uh, we'll, we'll have to look at all those things in its entirety and uh, make recommendations accordingly. Thanks. I run into that small change so often. I do have a question from our audience, so I will read it now. Hi, with respect to identity proofing, did you consider using a third party ID proofing such as allowing people to proof through their bank account or PayPal or Amazon? This is something other tax administrations around the world have used for their online accounts. From Nina Olson. So um, I don't believe there are any um, financial groups, um, and nor does like Google or Amazon meet NIST's uh, IAL2 uh, level of assurance at the moment. Um, but there, there could that could happen. You know, um, there could be some financial institutions that develop. Um, a CSP uh, that could be used with the government. Uh, but I'm not aware of any that exist right now. I have another question. Uh, for the Javad paper, are there sufficient VITA volunteers to handle both the current demand and the expected increase in demand should the outreach become a common occurrence? So that's something that we will have to uh, continue to look into how much uh, those VITA uh, sites are staffed. The feedback that we got when we initially started uh, the 2017 experiment was that nobody was using them because they just didn't know about them. Um, so that is something that we'll, we'll continue to monitor and uh, we'll monitor as things change and we uh, tend to use more online resources. And we're still open to more questions if anyone has them. Um, maybe a general to all of you, something I've been noticing as we plan projects is the fact we had the shutdown one year and the COVID now, and let's hope we get back to normal or who knows what else happens. How do you see foresee impacting these studies and your future work, if I could ask such a general thing? So for us, like I mentioned, we have a online VITA option that we're gonna to try to market too. Um, and we'll continue to, to market the free file that uh, hopefully uh, has an increase too. Yeah, and for us, um, it impacts the way we do our research. We do tend to do a lot of in-person research where we bring people in and observe them. Um, but we have developed a habit of doing remote research, which our, our two studies were, were both held remotely um, over the phone and with screen share. So at the moment, not a, a huge impact um, on, the, on the way we've been doing things. Yeah, I just see the questions we had so far. Maybe a, this is probably a small question for Becca. Um, in your study, I noticed the part where participants express concern that tax professionals as a group are less likely and less willing to own a personal smartphone. I found this surprising. What do you think of that? Yeah. Um, in fact, I think that's something we might end up looking at a little bit more in the future because I've heard that uh, within the IRS too, that, that tax pros weren't happy about, well, they, they might have a smartphone. The issue is that it might be um, provided to them by their, their company, um, but they might not have a personal one registered within their name, which is typically a requirement of these services. Um, so 
you know, having to go out and get another smartphone, I guess, is an issue. Um, but that would be something that, you know, we asked people what they thought other tax professionals would have issues with, and that was brought up several times. Um, so it, it would be interesting to explore that further. We do have another question coming in. Thank you. Are you worried that online and remote research will mean fewer low income or minorities will have their needs and preferences represented? Back from Nina again. And really, if any of you want to take this thought. But yeah, I, um, oh, yeah, I can take it first. I, I mean, I agree. And I think we actually do hope to target uh, people who are lower income in future research. Uh, and that will be something we'll have to figure out is how to do that effectively uh, in a remote fashion. Um, but I, I do have colleagues that have, um, you know, for example, done surveys that have targeted lower income groups in the past. Um, so um, we do hope to do that as well. Right. We do have a few more minutes yet. Uh, here's a question. Hi, to what extent are IRS offices required to take into account the findings and recommendations in these studies? Thanks. I'm not sure MITRE can always answer. <laughs> uh, they can do with it what they wish, I guess. <laughs> now I wonder, Mary Helen, would you have a perspective on that? Sorry, it took me a little while to get oh, off mute. Okay. So I, I guess my general opinion here is that um, people, which is part of the reason I asked sort of some of the questions I did of the, the two studies is that, you know, we do research to provide information and understanding and estimates of the likely effects. And then you share them with the leadership in IRS who oversee the particular programs that we did research studies on. And then ultimately it is their decision using that information about how they would want to proceed. Now, clearly I think part of the reason I asked, well, what are some of the, the costs and you know, what are the recommendations? Because I think cost definitely comes into play here, um, especially in our tight budget times where we're really not where, where things are substitutions, right? We, we, we're not having an expanding budget, so generally, you know, there's trade-offs. And, and so I think that, um, you know, people would take into consideration, um, you know, whether, you know, these, these changes sort of reduce costs. So for example, let me talk about the, the, the first paper. It's, you know, there was a discussion of, oh, well, it cost $4 to process a paper return and only so much to process the other one. Well, presumably, if you really were saving $4 or 350 presumably you would reallocate that money somewhere else. Um, and so w where you put it, I don't know. So anyways, I don't know if Alex or, or Rizwan, if you have, you know, thoughts from your experience. Sorry, I was clicking the wrong button. So I, I think you're right. You know, there's a lot of, you know, to, to implement some of this research, there's a lot of different considerations. It's, you know, are they, what's the body of evidence say? What, what's the cost to implement? And do we have the funds and where, or where do we get the funds? Because a lot of times it takes information technology and those sorts of things to, to make some of these things happen. Uh, um, and there's also, you know, tax law changes and other changes in, in pandemics, et cetera, that, that can, can delay stuff. But, um, you know, I think there's, there's a, a, a broader push in the government for evidence-based policy. And I think this is a, a you know, part of that push. And I might add over 30 years, we do a lot of studies, not everything becomes reality, but certainly put our best foot forward and discover what we can. Um, I know we're waiting for the next session. I'm trying to see who will be hosting that. 
Yeah, I know we're slightly early here, but I think we've covered the questions that I could think of. And I really want to thank all the panelists. And as others have said, uh, the people who worked on the committee to select the papers for this conference. Uh, it was an unusual year, but it, it's always an enjoyable process. If any of you in research have the opportunity, I, I recommend it. Alan Plumley has leadership over the years. Can't thank him enough. But with that, I'm willing to hand off. <laughs>